with three readers to come forward. Today is on ideas. Our faith is based on the deep longing between two lovers, each calling out for each other, each longing for each other, each waiting expectantly for that moment when they come together and their love is consummated. If you go to the catacombs in Rome, you see pictures to this day of the early Christians who were oppressed by the Roman regime of the day, paintings of them on the wall, holding up their hands like this, longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Two lovers, Yahweh and Israel, Jesus Christ and his church, longing for each other. And as those early Christians experienced, and Christians throughout the centuries have experienced, the more desperate the times, the more intense that longing. Church longing for Christ, and Christ longing for his church. As we lit the first Advent candle this morning, you may have noticed we had to have two goes at it. And even on the second go, there was only a tiny, tiny, fragile flicker. So I stayed there by the candle. Thank you, Joe, for preparing it as you do every year. And I thought it may be just going to go out. What a beautiful metaphor for the life of the church through the centuries. Sometimes it feels like it's just going to fizzle out. But no, came back to life, the little flame. Now it's burning brightly, unlike the artificial one that's electronic on the altar. We heard that reading there from Isaiah 64 and verse 1, which reads, Here is the people of God, you see, crying out to their God, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, God, and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Here is Israel in exile, 70 years of in a, living in a foreign land, desperately wondering when God is going to come back. Please, God, open it all up. Open the heavens up and come, please, back to us. We are waiting for you. And how hard to read those verses 6 and 7 of chapter 64. All, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. A sense not just of their own sin, but a sense of having been abandoned by their God. And then the cry in verse 8, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Potter, please, Master Potter, you who made us, you who formed us, come and shape us because we have become malformed and we need you O oh, loving potter, to come and take us in your hands, soften the clay, and then mold us. We are your people. You are our God. And that cry, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that cry that went up from the people of God on the lips of Isaiah all those centuries ago, that cry that you would come down, rend the heavens and come down, is answered 400 years later when Jesus at his baptism in the river Jordan sees the heavens rent asunder, opened up. And the spirit descending like a dove and falling on him. Do you see how sometimes it takes centuries for a prayer of desperate, desperate prayer to be answered? And we cry out, and God 
Acts. 400 years of silence between the end of the Old Testament canon and the coming of Jesus. 400 of years of waiting till he, the, the heavens were rent asunder. Jesus descended. Today we start the season of Advent, which is a season of waiting, of longing, of holy expectation. The Christian year begins today. We have tax years beginning in April and other years beginning in January and all kinds of secular years. But actually, since centuries, since the very early years, the Christian year has begun in Advent with a season of waiting. A season of waiting for Jesus to come. Two kinds of waiting. There's human impatience. Did you see the scenes at, at, on Black, it's Black Friday, it was called, isn't it? Black Friday. Did you see those scenes in our supermarkets across the country, all over? It is Black Friday, it's called, isn't it? People going completely crazy because they want to get in the door before everybody else at the sales in the big stores to get themselves their big flat screen or get themselves something, anything. No, no sense of expectation. What a terrible comment on, on our times. Human impatience. But then there is also another kind of impatience. Real impatience, but it's a holy impatience. It's the pa impatience, the holy impatience of the people of God waiting expectantly for the Lord Jesus to come back in glory. Two things, I think, prevent us from being an expectant and holy people. I think the first is nostalgia. Not looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus, but actually looking back to the past. Oh, the good old days. Oh, if only we could get back to how it used to be. You can never get there. You can never get back. However, even God can't rewind the video and get you back there. You can't go backwards in history. The basic Christian stance is looking forward to the future, to the coming of your lover, the Lord Jesus. So the first mistake is nostalgia. And the second, I think, is the thing that prevents us being an expectant, wholly impatient people is the idea of a utopia. That only, if only we could get everything all right, then it would be wonderful. Now, soon, tomorrow. It's a common mistake that we make. If only, um, it happens in all areas of life, if we only get the right captain t uh, for our football team, then we shall win and only get the right manager and then we'll win the, the world championship, you know. Only you can get everything right, yeah? A, a sort of false utopia. This is, this holy expectancy, this holy waiting is not about a utopia, a perfect world that we can create in our own strength. No, it's a gift from God, his kingdom coming towards us. Yeah? So watch out for nostalgia. Watch out for false utopias. So much of Jesus' teaching is about how to wait well. It's an act of the imagination. In the gospel, thank you, Abale, for reading the gospel to us. In the gospel, firstly, we find Jesus prick, pricking our imaginations, talking about the sun, how the sun in those days to come will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, but the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels from, to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, from the ends of the heavens. This is a cosmic vision. This, today, to really get into that, you need to train to, as an astrophysicist. Has anybody trained to be an astrophysicist? 
to, to be looking beyond our little context here, important though that is, and looking beyond to the greater glory of the heavens and being an expectant people waiting for the Lord Jesus to come, not just on our little bush meet, but actually on, not even on planet Earth, but the Lord Jesus to come in the context of this whole cosmos, which of course we understand so much better than the people back then with our telescopes and everything else. This has a cosmic scope. So we need to use our imaginations. Go out at night and look at the stars. That's what Jesus is doing here. But Jesus also invites us to be microbiologists. He invites us to look at the fig tree, to contemplate its branches and its leaves and to notice in that microbiology when the wood becomes soft and the leaves begin to change. Because that's the sign in the creation that something is changing. An expectant, holy people, a holy impatience for these things to come. So you might say, from the ends of the heavens down to the twigs and leaves of the fig tree, it's like looking through a spiritual telescope at the same, and the next moment looking through a spiritual microscope. Yeah? We are such limited people. We have such limited imaginations, but we have imaginations. Jesus says, use them, imagine, open your eyes, watch for the changes. observation, getting ready for the great coming. Not another bit of clever teaching, but for him, here is the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. And our faith is not a body of ideas that we adopt and say yes to. Our, our faith is a living relationship. Not that long ago I shared with you, um, I think it would be the sort of early spring and summer, how in the early hours of the morning in my bed over the road there, I hear sometimes a hoo-hoo, 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 right? <laughs> Coming from across Muirfield or Stopsley, somewhere out there, I guess. And then a wait, and then another one comes, a much stronger one, somewhere around where I live over there, going, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, I've heard you, I've heard you. <laughs> and then, so, yeah, feel free to laugh. But this is the kind of way we, we need to watch what's happening. One, I presume, I'm not orthologist, but I presume that um, one bird calls another in love, sending out her message across the fields, and then waiting for the response, and then the response comes, or sometimes doesn't come. Are we ready for his coming? Another rather more macho image, if you don't like my little cooing cuckoos, is the image Jesus gives us actually of a bouncer. Yeah, a bouncer. He tells us about how, in this parable, a bouncer is appointed to wait at the door. Actually, not waiting so much for the coming, uh, for, for trouble, but waiting for a guest of honor to arrive at the door. So we're invited to be bouncers. Scary thought if you live in Luton. We're invited to be bouncers waiting at the door for the coming of the Lord Jesus in glory. Yeah? Have you ever watched a bouncer at a door? they got the poshest suit on, haven't they? Yeah, Armani. And they're usually very big and strong <laughs> and scary. But have you noticed their eyes? They're looking at who's coming around. They're waiting for trouble, but they're also waiting for the, sometimes for the, the guest of honor. Our daughter, Rebecca, um, who works in television, as you know, sometimes has to set up interviews with very important people. And she tells us about Russell Brand who she's had to interview at different places across Europe. 
And he never turns up on the right moment. He never turns up. He turns up when he feels like it. So they all have to wait expectantly for the moment when Russell Brand will walk in the door. We need to be expectant like that because we don't know the hour, but we are to watch for the signs. Advent, then, this season that has begun today, a series, actually, of horizons coming towards us, waiting for the sunrise. As I woke this morning, the sun was b- b- shining in a gentle, dark sort of purple through the mist and into my windows. We're waiting for a series of horizons, and the scriptures often pick this up. So in Psalm 19, verses 4 and 5, we read this. In the heavens, he, this is the bridegroom, in the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at the one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. So the coming of the Lord Jesus is like a bridegroom on his wedding day coming out of his tent like the sun rising in the east. Another image. Another image that Jesus gives us is that moment in the dawn when the rooster, the cock, crows, a sign that is coming, that the sun is rising, the new life is coming. So a series of horizons coming towards us. We wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus now in this season, when we celebrate his birth at Christmas in a few weeks' time. Yeah? Jesus coming, we shall celebrate his birthday. That's the first coming, the remembrance of his birthday. We relive that moment when he was born in a stable in poverty in Bethlehem. But then there's also, as we've been saying, that coming at the end of time when he will come in glory on the day of the Lord to wind it all up. He will become as a judge. He will come to do away with sin and suffering and even death itself at the end of time. That's the end time. But I want to say to you as well that there are lots of little horizons all the way down the road to keep us going. Because if you have no sign of hope, no sign of his coming, no little woo-woo coming back to you, then you start to despair, don't you? Yeah? If you have nothing coming back from your lover, then you start to, your heart goes cold and you fall into what the Bible calls dissipation and drunkenness. We need these little signs, these little horizons that come towards us. And I'm going to ask you in a moment what they might be for you at the moment. The little signs that keep you alive, that keep you mindful that Jesus is revealing himself to you unveiling his presence to you, little moments of epiphany, manifestations of his presence in your life that keep you waiting. Okay, that's how it's now. Just imagine how it's going to be when I see him face to face in glory. Sudden, unexpected, long-awaited moments where you realize that God is near, when the twigs are getting tender and the leaves are coming out. These moments are fleeting. There are many places in Scripture when we have them. Never more so, I think, than in the book of Song of Songs, this love poetry between the man and the woman, where through this Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, these two lovers are longing for each other, longing for the presence of each other. But here in chapter 5, verses 4 to 6, this is what we, she is saying. My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. 
My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The very real absence at times of the lover. Do any of you experience presence of the loving Lord Jesus 24-7, every second, every minute of the day with equal intensity? Please say if you do. Guess what? I don't. I've never met anybody who claims that. Jesus comes like a lover. Then he disappears. He comes again. <coughs> when you have a moment, read the whole of Song of Songs. It's uh, an allegory, an uh, imaginative story of two lovers in this way, longing for each other, waiting for consummation in the same way that Jesus, his bridegroom, and his bride, the church, are waiting for consummation. We're not there yet. So, would any of you like to come forward and share your experience of God's absence, of his coming in a big way or a tiny way? Because we need to be encouraged by each other. The encouragement might actually be somebody coming and saying that for a week I felt nothing, no presence of God at all, or a month, or a year. It might be encouragement for you because you may feel the same might be somebody coming and saying, just last week in the train, this is what happened, and there he was, coming and then going. Who would like to come? Thank you. Um, it's, it's quite an obvious thing, but, it, you know, I was kind of reading the Bible this week. I can't remember uh, whereabouts, but it's about the crucifixion. And I can imagine Satan looking at Jesus on the cross and thinking... This is my ultimate victory. Of those three days, really reveling in that and being jubilant in that victory. And then when Jesus rode, it was the ultimate defeat. And I think sometimes in life, we go through and we feel so defeated. Satan is really tying us up and we feel destroyed. But actually, God is in control and he will reveal himself to us and bring us, and he will take us through these situations for a purpose. We might not see it at the moment, but whatever anybody's going through in the church at the moment, however much you're struggling, God is in it. And God will reveal himself and bring you through that. I want to share something else with you. And uh, I think most of you know I'm the union rep in Luton. Um, we have a sister office in Lee Grave. And the union rep down there is, um, is actually also the deputy area rep. And every bi-monthly we have to have a meeting with all the area reps from around the uh, East Anglia region over in Milton Keynes. It's a bit of a standing joke, he always wants a lift for some reason, his car's in here or it's in there. But it got to about 10 o'clock Thursday night and this meeting's on Friday. I thought, great, I've got away with it. Get a text, it's Martin, what time are you picking me up in the morning? Oh, okay. Um, I like Martin, he's very good. I've, I've been in meetings with him um, one of the first meetings I went with him, we had to meet with all the regional directors and everything, and I was pulled over there to talk about Luton's situation. I actually got 10 seconds. He was talking for about three hours. We just didn't move. Um, so anyway, we got in the car. Uh, Martin's an out-and-out -out atheist, and he doesn't hide that fact. I would call him a better Bible scholar than me because he knows his Bible, he knows the Quran, inside out, so he can punch holes in it. And so we got onto a little bit of a debate on the way there, and he asked me, um, and I said, look, Martin, you will need perhaps the experiences that I've had, you know, and I, I shared with him that um, I could speak in tongues. I didn't actually speak in tongues to him because I don't think that's right. But I shared with him, I could, we actually, then we ended up at the meeting. And I thought, oh, that, I've got away with that one. Um, and then after the meeting, we got back in the car to drive back, and his first words were to me, I'm not letting you get away with that. <laughs> I thought, what's he on about? 
And uh, so I actually shared my complete testimony with him. And he was going on about the fact that he knew when he died, he was just going to go into the earth and that would be, it will be eaten up by the worms, end of story. And he was just so belligerent on that. But I kept, I thought, oh, golly, Lord, how am I going to get out of it? No, I didn't want to get out of it, but how can I change the subject in some way? Because I think he's battering me. And uh, in the end, by the end of the journey, from being somebody that I'm an atheist, I'm going into the ground, he said to me, I'll know when that day when I die, whether it's true or it's not true. And I thought, he's moved. And he also got out. This is one thing you can pray, with, pray uh, about. He said, do you know what? If you go back, because Lee Graver actually moving into the Luton office, he says, if you start praying that we get our own office, Lee Grave, then I will believe. I said, I'm starting to pray now. <laughs> and, then, and then he said to me, the other thing he said to me, all you share with me, I don't know if I'll be out of sleep now. I said, I'll pray for that as well. But if you could hold Martin up in prayers and the post office, we're a very, I'm not an argumentative person, but yesterday I was at work and I ended up having three arguments. We've been having arguments all week with management. We've got a new manager in there. Um, they call him the smiling assassin. He's really nice to your face and then he'll drop something in, you know, treat people really badly. But if you could pray for us at Luton at this, obviously Christmas coming up, it's a very busy time. Um, and my role has become, uh, as I say, I'm not an argumentative person, but I'm having to be argumentative because I want to stand up for the oppressed, and I feel that we're being oppressed down there at the moment. I think a lot of the employment law is very suppressive in this country now, and the management style we've got in Royal Mail is actually leading to that. They want to, they're saying they're trying to work together for growth. They're not. They're trying to suppress the workers. Anyway, sorry, I've gone on a bit. No, that was really interesting. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, you know that I go down to Africa, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, I've been looking after a family for about seven years, and they were tiny little children, and now they're growing up to about this size. But one of them died about three, four weeks ago with Ebola, uh, Aisha, and there's four of this family. And when, the fam when Aisha died, the family were taken into quarantine. And when they went in there, they were, keep, they were kept there for a week, tested, etc., etc. Couldn't find that they had anything wrong with them. So they were let out again, come back home. And when they came home, when, when they were in there, this medic, this English lady who was looking after them, she started to tell them about Jesus. This is a Muslim family, by the way. And she started to say to them about our Lord Jesus. And, you know, how the Lord works miracles and how you should have Ebola because you're dealing, you were dealing with your sister, touching her and everything. They, they're very cuddly people. And uh, what had happened was that they were let out. So they said, she, uh, one of them, Zaina, said, well, I know about Jesus, but, but we're Muslim. And she said, well, why don't you ask Jesus and pray to him to come into your life and thank him for what he has done for you? So she phoned me up and she said, um, last week they went to the Catholic Church. And the priest started to talk to them and said, look, you need to be baptized. So the whole family today is going to the Catholic Church this morning. And she phoned me up, she said, oh, Mr. Jimmy, she said, I want to say this, I want to say, when I was talking to this lady, this medic, she said, only one man only one man has ever helped us. One man. That was the old man, me. For seven years I've looked after them. Give them money, help the family, get them to school, etc. I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, by the way. But what has happened is, you'll never know. Just takes one person can change the whole life or bring Jesus to them people. So just by our actions alone, Martin, we need to bring Jesus to them people and to whoever we meet along the way. Thank you. Yeah. Jesus comes to us through the other, the friend. Um, Nigel, would you like to say something about what you've told me about briefly um, with Muslim people experiencing Jesus in their dreams? Would you do that for us? It's just come to mind hearing Jimmy there. sort of put me on the spot there. Um, 
Yes, um, certainly it's uh, one of the really important things that's happening uh, right across the world today is that Muslim people are experiencing Jesus coming into their lives in a, uh, a very real way. He will often appear to them during the night and they will report, report that they have seen a man dressed in white standing at the foot of their bed and holding his hands up and showing still the holes in his hands. And they recognize that this is Jesus because to the Muslims, he is the most important prophet apart from Muhammad. And he's also the only one that they believe can raise people from the dead. So Jesus has this very important um, position within the Muslim faith. I was tempted to step forward and say something, uh, which I'm going to do so now because of Martin asking me to come up here. Because um, I will be praying a lot uh, shortly for the nation of Nigeria, and I'll explain why. But that was already on my heart to do that before the big event in Kano. I assume you've all heard, but there was this huge attack on the Grand Mosque this week in Kano. That mosque is situated within the Emir's palace and the emir has been telling the civilian population that they need to fight Boko Haram. So I think one can be pretty sure that that attack has all the hallmarks of Boko Haram. But Martin was talking about watching for events that are pointing to the return of Jesus. And I would like to put it to you that this may be one of those events. And we need to be praying because there's this belief in some quarters, and I certainly share this, that a lot of Muslims are going to be turning to Jesus because they are seeing what fellow Muslims are doing to Muslims. Now, this has gone on through the centuries, but I don't think it's ever happened in front of the cameras as it is today, so that the whole world is seeing this. So let's keep the people of Kano in our prayers. 120 have already died from that attack and there's hundreds more that were injured. Let's pray for the Christians there. As you'll hear in the prayers, they have been suffering tremendously in Nigeria. Those Christians, I wouldn't be surprised if many of them will be helping their Muslim neighbors in this time. A great opportunity like Jimmy, Jimmy's uh, account for conveying the love of Christ and let's also be praying that Muslims will be thinking about that situation and what does it tell them about their faith. That there is this dreadful stream within Islam. I'm not saying that it's all Muslims are bad. The Muslims, there's a lot of them, are really wonderful seekers after God. But there is that stream within Islam that is very violent. And let us pray that this will be one of those moments for a lot of people to turn to Christ. I'll be continuing now. Yes, thank you very much, Martin. <coughs> okay, we're going to need to roll on just a minute unless there's anybody bursting to share something. Okay, good. So let's um, 